start at 11 a.m. At 11 a.m. And um, then the service will be about a 45 minute hour service. You know how y'all get. And then we'll have, we'll start the festival afterwards. Uh, we won't be streaming that day. Um, don't forget to wear dress down and be relaxed. Um, we need volunteers for that Sunday. Uh, call the church office and let them know. Uh, the cook off is for, you know, when we get ready to cook off, Melinda, we're getting ready to cook. We're only going to cook macaroni and cheese, pound cakes, and sweet potato pies. So now you can cook any dessert that you want to, but those will be the three things that are actually going to be labeled for the cook off. Who makes the best macaroni and cheese? And we won't call no names. Who does the best pound cakes and 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 who did the sweet potato pie? Now you don't want to mess up the sweet potato pies, okay? Those, those are the most healthy of all three of those, okay? <laughs> so I also call the office um, and you can bring your dessert. Your other desserts can be brought in, but they just won't be judged. Also, that will be a book bag day of supplies to give away at the festival for our kids going to school. Um, you can help do that with a book bag or buy supplies, bring it to the information desk at the church during the, during the week. Also um, asking that we will have a raffle, raffle tickets and prizes will, and also the, the group spoken word will be there and we will have a DJ. So we plan to have a really good, well-rounded time. Uh, pop and asking you to also support with some pop and water can be dropped off at the uh, information desk and just leave it there and we'll handle it from there between every day between 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. So I'm asking you all, hear this, let's work according. I'm looking for a really exciting day. I'm asking a big sis bud and the baby to show up. Let's all get there. It's a good time to fellowship and, and, and get together. Amen. We'll do that. For our next reading session, um, I'm, I'm asking you to read the book of Ephesians. Um, starting in August, the elders will be on a schedule on Facebook. And remember, when we go to August, we're going to do that from Facebook. Uh, we won't be on Zoom. Um, Facebook is a, is a little bit wider profit. I'm trying to give my media team time to rest. So we're going to do this and see how this works out and do it. Everybody got to have a little rest. Okay, so we will be on Facebook. But every day you will hear someone from the ministerial staff reading from the book of Ephesians. We're going to be reading it until it gets in your spirit and go all the way through it. And with those we have on staff and those that are reading, we should probably go through that six chapters probably about three times before the end of the month. So just getting through it, and you're going to, when August is over, until we finish it, we're going to keep reading it, and I'll be reading it. Uh, I presume that they will be coming in at different times, but uh, subscribe, and you'll hear the ding come up, and you'll know it's us letting you hear the word and sharing the word of God, trying to do things that are going to connect us and use this moment that God has given us to do that. The elders are asked, the elders are asked, the elders the ministerial staff, which includes the overseers, it includes the elders, the mentees. The, I'm asking them to read First and Second Timothy as well as Ephesians. Um, and then just what I'm looking for people to do is that as you read it, as they read, as the elders read the um, uh, second, First and Second Timothy, as you go per chapter, just write a little summary. Because in October, we're going to have a Zoom and discuss this. This is what we're going to be discussing and talking about where we fit in First and Second Timothy. What things are we doing and not doing? How we can be stronger as a ministerial body. And that's what we need to do there. That's what we'll be doing. Um, this, this season, you all, I want you all to come to grips with understand that we have been in the midst of a shift. God is shifting. You remember the last time that we talked about a shift, and that was because of what, um, when we had actually moved from 11 o'clock service to our two services at 8 o'clock, and then we moved again to the one service, giving both um, when I became the overseer, and that y'all allowed us to do that, and we moved it. So now we're still in that, God is shifting again. I need us to understand that the, 
the actual reason that we are doing things differently is because there's been a shift. There has been, and it actually, if I want to say the technical name, um, is there, the dispensation has changed. Okay? There's been a change, and dispensation means the house rules have changed. What God is expecting is now at a different place and a different time. And over this pandemic, he used the pandemic to put the church back on. What is that thing called when um when you when your your gadget, when all of your computer gadgets don't act right? Or what's that called when they gotta want it to start over or make the updates that it's supposed to make? Um what's that term? Y'all y'all know. Um somebody put it in the in the um in the chat. You know what I'm talking about. When you um uh, reboot. That's it. Reboot. Reboot. Reset. Reset. That's it. That's what the pandemic is done to the church. For us to get back to what God wants us to do. And so that's that's one of the reasons why I'm trying to explain to you all. We'll be talking about um, our attitudes of how we're handling things. That's why I wanted to go on Thessalonians. But then... W- I needed to bring in the fact of what God is doing right now in this shift. I need you to touch yourself and come to agree with, with, with come and agree with me that God is resetting us. Well, here, say this. God has reset us because we are changing and we are doing. It's a reset season. And in this reset season, there are some things that he has actually given us new definition for. And that is why when we come, when we're coming to church and we're actually going to understand when we come to the temple, that what we're going to do is our basic reasonings for what we're doing in coming to the temple. Let's see if I can put it in the chat for you. Okay. There's three reasons that we're emphasizing now why we are attending, why we are coming, what we're doing in this season. And it's important that you kind of make note of this so so you won't, you know, when, when they ask you, uh, you'll have, you'll know what we're doing. One of the reasons is that we, we're coming to, to worship God our Father. Um, the second reason, I'm going to come back to it, is, is to offer... Praise progress reports. Okay. And the third reason is to receive instruction. Now, understand at any given point, all three of them can be done. It could be emphasized on one level to worship the Father. He might break in and call for that, or he might call for us to give praise reports that lead us to high praise. And worship or to receive instruction now I want you to hear hear how we're looking at that because I want you to understand to worship the Father worship God our Father it involves Thanksgiving it involves Thanksgiving and that's telling God Thanksgiving is telling God thank you for what he's doing always remember that Thanksgiving is our admission I didn't make it by myself and it includes us while we do it. We're always thinking of us. We're always telling God, thank you for how you kept my family. Thank you for how you gave me the job, this, that, and the other. Uh, praise and worship talks about when you get to praise, excuse me, to praise, you're acknowledging his attributes. You're acknowledging that he is the healer. You're acknowledging that he is the way maker. He is the one. It's going That too includes you because you will, you will, Give that response according to what he has done for you. Okay. Any questions? Are y'all with me so far? Okay. Okay. And then then also you will worship. Worship itself recognizes and submits to his person. When we get into worship, it is only you and him. It's only just him. You, you, you're not caught up or captivated by the whole thing. Um, Carrie, can you get me Habakkuk 2.20? I, I don't really want to. Uh, I want to 
Wait, hold on, hold on for a minute. Let me put this down here first, and then we'll come back to that because I don't want to get ahead of myself. Okay, worship of the Father on our time. When, uh, worship the God, our Father, our God. Thanksgiving, thanksgiving for what He's done. Praise, acknowledge His attributes. Worship recognizes and submits to His person. If you would understand, understanding that uh, worship, recognizing and submits to His person. If you would give me Isaiah, Isaiah, uh, Denise, give me Isaiah. Six and one. It's in the Old Testament, Denise. I know. I got it. Okay. Isaiah 6 and 1. I got it. Okay. okay. In the year that King Uzziah died, mm -hmm. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, okay. high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Listen to Isaiah's description of his worship time before he didn't say we saw him. He said, I saw him. There comes a time in your life that you will see the father as no one else has ever seen. him. Listen to what happened. He, re he recognizes this is the father. Go ahead. And the train of his robe filled the temple. His glory was everywhere. Go on. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. Mm -hmm. And with two, he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Mm -hmm. now listen, and, the post, go on. and the post of the doors were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. Submission. And I yes, dwell. That's enough. That's enough. So, so I want y'all to hear. He recognized the highness and the glory that God, he automatically then submits. There comes a time. If you can think of the three things that worship will do will do is that it starts with a conversation there is a song going on and then there is silence that's that part where you get to where you allow god to get to your spirit and begin to talk we'll talk about that we'll be doing some more on it i want to share the cycle of worship how we are how we're going to what what happens when we really worship Did I do it twice? I did sure did. Might help if I copy the right part. Our, the, when we get to worshiping God, we start off with worship and recognizing his person. Then in the midst of your worship, when you're together or by yourself, revelation proceeds. Out of that comes impartation. He then empowers you to do so. Then manifestation. Then thanksgiving, praise, back to worship. This is the cycle of our worship service when we come to worship him. This is the cycle you ought to be going through when you're by yourself. So that you begin to understand that as I acknowledge his presence, he's guaranteed to give me a revelation. He's guaranteed to give you revelation. 
and then you have impartation. He'll never reveal something to you that you won't be empowered to do. Okay, and then he'll, as you walk it, he will give manifestation. As you begin to see it come to pass, then you begin to give him thanksgiving. And then you go into praise. Then you go back to worship for the next phase. This is our cycle. This has been our cycle for the past 37 years. This is the fruit. Of, this is the foundation that our fruit has come from. Are, are there any questions? When we worship God, If we were to break worship down to an acostia, this is the worship. Worship is willingness. Um, can you all get, one of y'all get, get the scripture? Or if everybody, they, can everybody see the scriptures I'm using? Because everybody can get one. Listen, willingness in Isaiah 119. Go ahead. Isaiah 1 and 19, if you are willing and obedient. Right, now listen to what he's saying, because there is, there is a, a stage in our lives that we are obedient, but we're not willing. Mm. Which means your worship is affected. He, he said, in fact, he said, you got to be willing before the obedience is really verified. Want to do. Willing is that it's a choice I'm making of my own. I am so excited about doing. And we, he, when it comes to worship the Father, you can't make people worship. If they don't have a willingness to do it, it won't get done. Willing. He said that you got to be willing and obedient. Second John uh, 2, 1 and 6. Anybody? It's right behind first John. J O H N and Second John two and six. One and six. Oh, second John one and six. There, there is no two. This is love. Second John one and six. Mm -hmm. Amen. To knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance. No, 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 no. <laughs> Second, Second John 1 and 6. John. There you go. This is love. Right. That we walk according to his commandments. Do you hear that? He just says, if you love me, just if you want to prove that you're worshiping me and you're loving me, obey what I ask you to do. So therefore, obedience is the highest praise, not hallelujah. We have to obey his word if our worship is to have the effect that it's supposed to have. The, the, um, the R is for response. You saw Isaiah's response. He fell down and found himself. But go ahead. When we respond to God, Matthew 22, 37. Matthew 22 and 37. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Did you hear that? This is our response. You have to get to a place that you love him with your entire essence of the inner part of you. At the bottom, at the bottom of your heart, if I want to say, ought to be the love of God. It ought to be in your very spirit. That I love God. I love him with everything I have. 
everything. There's nothing more important. Do I have anybody that understands what I'm saying? Can you bear witness with me that you're at that place? There's nothing more important than God, than my love for him. It's got to be. It's got to be that point. Here's the part in Hebrews 13 and 15 is, is the sacrifice. And you can quote, you can look at, I'll, I'll quote it, but go ahead and I want you to read it, Hebrews 13, 15. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. Okay, the sacrifice of praise is when you have to worship God and you're challenged by that which you love. My, my, my illustration is Genesis 22 and 1 through 17. When, when Abraham was forced, he, God said, you, you know, I want to test you, so offer your son. Yeah. All of us, whether you realize it or not, to show that we love God, had to get to this point. It might not have been a child. It may have been a position. It may have been a job. It may have been some money. But God all has this right to test our love for him and take it to the point. If not, if we can't love him with all of our heart and through a sacrifice of love. And sacrifice of love is actually got to understand this praise that we got to give him. Come to understand you can't sacrifice anything to God you ain't paid for. David, David was the king, and and um, the what the gentleman was going to give him this land to bury and to sacrifice to build for for a sacrifice. And he said, "You're the king. You can have whatever you want. Just take it. I'm free of charge." He said, "How can I offer something to the Lord I have not paid for?" And so, so we have to understand our worship is affected when we don't move by the graces of willingness and obedience. Just because we love God, we sacrifice. And our sacrifice to God will never be bigger than the glory he'll bestow back on us. Is that, I think the next verse says that in uh, Hebrews 13 and 15. I think it says that so that you come to understand what that really means. But... but um, Go ahead. Hebrews 13 and 15. Mm -hmm. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips. Yeah. You keep giving on thanks. You go on. Giving thanks to his name. Mm -hmm. But do not forget to do good and to share. Mm hmm. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. That's, that's the goal of our sacrifice, that God be pleased. When he's pleased, that's where the song comes from. When, when blessings go up, when, when praises go up, blessings come down. That's the scriptural reference for that. You have to have you have to be willing, obedient, have a response that's from your heart, have a sacrifice that you paid for, and the next one is have your heart. Hebrews 10 22. This thing has got to hit into the conscious part of your inner being. You gotta worship him because you have a conscience. Hebrews 10. Let us go ahead. 1022. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience mm -hmm. and our bodies washed with pure water. Which means that now that you now that we know the Lord, our heart understands good and evil. And we are conscious of what we're doing. And God says that if you're going to worship me properly, what I need you to do is honestly be conscious of the wrong of, of my goodness and who I am. Our worship would be also the I in, in worship is for intentional. Proverbs 3, I mean, I mean, Philippians 3, 14, 3 and 14. That's the old one. Y'all know that by heart. 
Go ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize. It, it, it means you got to do it on purpose. Psalms 100. You, you have to make a noise on purpose. If you intend to worship, you got to set some time aside that you're going to meet with the Father. You and him, you, you got to have a time reference that you have said And this six o'clock study time does not include your time of worship, our time with worship. You got to, and that means you got to go before him, not because you're the pastor or because you're the bishop or because you're the deacon or because you got to get a teaching lesson or you need help. No, there ought to be a time intentionally that you set aside. You ought to have a date time with God. Are y'all okay? Amen. Okay. Also, the P is for positioning. John, Gospel of John 15, 1 through 17. Um, let's just take a time and walk through that positioning part. I'm not done with this. That's just the first part of why we come into church. Go ahead. Whoever has it. I am the true vine. Mm hmm and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me mm -hmm. that does not bear fruit, mm -hmm. he takes away. When and we worship, we recognize the, ne the necessity of being connected to the father. We don't want to try to live our lives separately from him. Paul said in the book of Galatians, oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you to think that you can begin in the spirit and switch over to your flesh? We're, we, we're too close now. We have been, on, been with him too long to think that our positioning isn't important. Without him, we can bear no fruit. Go ahead. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Yes. So, so some folks say, I'm doing everything right, and it seems like, and then every now and then something hurts. It's called pruning. Your worship will make him prune you in order for you to bring forth more fruit. Sometimes we say we love him as long as he ain't taking the shears and cutting pieces off, making things leave. But it's for our good, and therefore we can rejoice because he thought enough of me not to be carrying dead weight. Wow. Go on. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Mm -hmm. Abide in me. That's the key word. Positioning is abiding in Christ. That's the key word. If you abide in him by, by obeying his word and his word live in you. And that means to the point that David said that I'm abiding in him so much that his word have I hidden where? In, in my, my heart. heart. So that I what? Won't I'm sin. sin so here, I want y'all to do this one thing. Take the word sin out and put your complication in there. I want to hide his word in me so tough that, that I would not, that I would forgive like he wants me to. That I won't lust like I want to. That, that I won't get high-minded and pride. I'm talking about me. I'm not talking about y'all because y'all don't have these issues. But, but you need to stop just saying a general statement of saying that I'm going to position myself so that I can bear fruit. This is the important part of what we're missing in our worship. This is what we're going to be reiterating when we come to worship. Are there any questions over that? Any connection? Any insight? Can I move on? Okay. The second reason that we actually, we talked about doing is that we're coming to give praise progress reports. Now, remember in June, in January, the church was deployed to use the gifts and to use what God has given you to spread the word in everything. And we talked about being deployed. That means that you actually are taking your gifts and what impact have you made with somebody's life on a weekly basis? Who did you go out of your way 
through what you have, your spiritual gift and your talents, did you impact somebody's life to let them know about the relationship you have with God, not by your mouth, but by your actions. So, so this is, so that means that the difference between a praise progress report and a testimony is that you're not talking about yourself as you would in a testimony. You're actually talking about somebody else that you helped saw change their life because of what you did and you bring them with you as the receipt. Ooh. Are y'all with me? So that, that means that when th we're going there to make sure that we're using our spiritual gifts. That's why it's important that we'll be teaching on the spiritual gifts and knowing that there's a difference between talents and, and, and spiritual gifts, that we will know your spiritual gift according to the word of God. Talents are things that you are trained to do that you don't necessarily need the spirit to do them. They can be enhanced by the spirit if you submit that. That's why a lot of times well, teachers who have the gift of teaching have trouble submitting their gift to the, to, to the spirit of God because they have been trained in a particular way. But once that is submitted, their gift of teaching becomes empowered and it becomes a gift. But you must have the gift. And we'll talk about all that. Why do I, why do I want to deal with gifts? Because here's a category that I want you to understand. Identification of the gift. Why do we need to understand how we work? Here's the first thing. If we, your gift helps you to determine God's will for your vocation. You'd be surprised at how many of us spent so much time in another area, and I'm talking about secular, just because that's what we wanted to do didn't realize God had something else for us according to our gift. And how many of you now don't even realize that you've been working your spiritual gift and didn't know that that's where God had planted you? If you, I, usually the vocation that he plants you in is that you walk in and you're over trained for the pure place where you're work on work your gift. It's usually around people that you don't like. <laughs> Ooh, let me see this whole screen. I can't see everybody. It's usually that you spend the first six months grumbling about why am I on this job? Can I get a witness up in here somewhere? <laughs> and you be talking about, I don't know why God sent me here. Ain't that funny? I don't even know why you don't, you don't want to own that. He sent you there, but as soon as you can't figure out that you are in a valley of dry bones and it's going to take your spiritual gift to turn that place around. When you start operating in your, and that don't mean you walk around telling everybody you go to church and everything, but because the gift will override and it'll help you to know that your, that God has determined your vocation for you. It's then that you begin to understand where it is, what, what it's all about, what you should do. Could you imagine what our church would be like if everyone accepted their secular place in the kingdom as God's putting them there, and then we come back with praise reports of who we changed on our job? Because you know you can't leave the job until you finish the assignment. He had asked Ezekiel. That's what Ezekiel found out. And then when you're there and you're understanding what you're doing, you come to a place where you understand that, well, wait a minute, God. He says, can they live? And you can never tell the area that he's assigned to you that it can't live. <laughs> These people ain't going to never change. Yes, they will. If you start speaking it, he sent you there to be life. He sent you there to be light. 
not for you to join in with what they already doing. Our, if our whole church, number two, one thing about why we have to learn gifts, do you realize that our whole church would be mobilized for the mission? We came here with a mission, with a slang, with our our, vo- our, our theme of, of, of ministering to the total man. And if we all became wrapped around that, our gifting fits into what we're trying to do. See, many of us don't understand that, that that's why someone, there should be no one sitting in church talking about they don't have nothing to do. What you're admitting is you don't know your spiritual gift. Y'all making me think I'm on Sunday morning. I'm just trying to teach. Listen, listen, the third reason is that it assists you in setting priorities for study, growth, and ministry. When you understand that you have an administrative gift, then you don't wait till the last minute to make sure things are right. You, you literally put it together. We study to make sure that we are, that we are effective in what we do. Here, here, it gives the, another reason. When you know what your gift is, what your spiritual enablement is from God. It gives each Christian a sense of dignity and self-worth. Generally, when people don't know their gift, they have low self-esteem, and they also lack confidence in what the work is supposed to be done. But when you know that you know what God told you to do and what God and get and what he has and gifted you to do, you take the power of the Holy Ghost and accomplish the task. When you understand your gifting, you understand that it enables you to receive the gift of ministries of others. A lot of times when you're hearing people talk about, I don't like them, they don't do this, and they ought to do that, and they complain of this, and what they're really saying is they don't know and they don't feel confident in their own. When you know yours, you will, we will automatically applaud other people in their gifting. This is why we're talking. This is why we're talking what goes on. Remember, we come to church. We come to church, come to the temple to worship the Father and to give a praise report, a praise progress report, not just a testimony, a praise progress. There's enough of us, and we've talked enough about ourselves. We need to get to a place to where we will begin to talk about about what we've done for other people. Amen. Y'all with me? Amen. Right here. Is this any questions? The third reason that we come together is to receive instruction. Now, now you got to understand instructions are inclusive, but not limited to teachings like we're having right now. Sermons where there is not really a, a response back prophetic utterings or talking or speakings and then when the when the lord pulls us in which the world will learn down how that works as well if the church can understand that our services will be broken up this way and how we do it we will begin to have more instruction for what we're doing and where we're going receiving instructions comes through i'm sorry I want you to okay what did I do hit the wrong button when I get excited I lose direction y'all okay when you receive instructions include the teachings and that's why we're going over that's why we're going over Ephesians that's why we're doing things Sermons will be constructed around this very thing. 
Prophets will know how to respond and what they're supposed to do. Prophets and the, these people, this here, actually is broken down to designated gifts of the body. This is where we're going to get into our um, five-fold ministry so that you understand what it is and we'll be talking it. The main things of these of this particular teaching is that we come to understand who our gifts are and what they do. Now, there are more gifts than this, but these are the Ephesian four gifts that are that are the foundation for what we're doing. The apostle, the apostle who governs. He's actually administrative, the leadership over everything. He starts stuff, but he governs how it is because it's then turned over to others that are working the ministry. Okay, then you have the prophet. The prophet is the index finger and they do the pointing. They guide the church. They help to guide the church. Then you have the evangelist who, who, who happens to be the one who gathers the church, gets the excitement of the church, pulls people in, shows them. All of these are done according to the will of God and that God is the center of them. The evangelist, then you have the pastor who guards the church, who actually walks through everything with you. Those with the pastor's nurture, nurture a shepherding spirit. And we'll talk about all of that, how we understand different roles that pastors play and that evangelists play. The teacher is the one who grounds people. This is the actual reality of change comes in. These are not hierarchy levels. They are actually on a horizontal plane and they respect one another's boundaries. I, I need to make that plain because yes, yes, I realize I may be the apostle of this thing, but I also, also in my governing, I, I respect the prophet, the evangelist. I'm not a prophet. I have, I have the gifts of prophecy, which every Christian ought to have and as you use them, but, but there are those that walk in the office of the prophet. And you, those are distinct, that's a distinct place. That the, the evangelist, one that actually evangelizes, not just the, he gathers people together for the work of God. And then the problem the churches have is that we have had a lot of evangelists who didn't have a pastoral gift, but they started a church and instead of turning it over to a pastor, they used it as a place for their income instead of actually teaching and grounding the people. We've seen that. So I'm trying to share with you what goes on. And then you have the teacher. The teacher is the one who grounds you, who gets you, who talks you through stuff. As, as your, your leader, these are the gifts that I possess to help give a roundedness and help to identify others who have them, who will help the calling. I need you, I'm going to be passing out a list of about 26 gifts that are in the body. Yep. And you're going to have to hear the definition and begin to ask God, is this where you want me? And right now, if you would, I don't want you to turn it in, but on your piece of paper, write down what you think your gifts are. Because if the church operates on this, it is guaranteed growth. It is guaranteed maturity. It is guaranteed the will of God. And we're not just coming for a praise service. Or we're not just coming to be hidden and just doing this. It's, it's a shift, y'all. We are in the midst of a shift that the Father has caused. When we say church ain't going to be like it used to be, it's not. Because when I come with just the focus of the Father, when I come to, to be able to say, this week we were able to touch these lives. When I come with the reality that out of the lesson of what God is telling, the instructions are for us to remain faithful, for us to take in new things, for us to do this, that, and the other. As opposed to coming, I want God to do something for me as opposed to coming, looking for a blessing. Why not come being prepared to have been a blessing and watch God move. Just give me, give me six months of trying to put this together and see where we are six months from now and see when God change your very personal status. I'm challenging you. This is how we're laying. That is why when we're coming 
the church doesn't have to have the regular meet beating or meeting that it did every Sunday. And I know everybody's waiting for the every Sunday. Whatever happened to the impulse of understanding that God is calling us to meet when he needs us to meet, that we surrender to his timetable, which means you remember, and I think it's in um, Exodus 13 or Numbers 13, 19. I'm not for sure. I'm, I'm losing my track of it. But when when they were in the tabernacle, and it says, I think it's 9.15, Exodus 9, is that they were in the tabernacle and built it up and everybody set it up and then the cloud came and set over it. And then it said that the, the formula was that when the cloud moved, the people moved. And do you know what that means? It means that they got all set up and then after they set up, they worship, and then God moved. They had to take everything down, repack it, and move with him. And he said sometimes he would stay over them for a week, or he would stay for two years, or he would move from day to day. But the activity of their, the activity, the daily activity was never more important than his moving. The question is, have we gotten so comfortable in our standing still? Have we gotten so comfortable in our stationary worship that we no longer seek the move of God? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want us to be so placed, so comfortable that we feel we just got to do it this way. What if God wants to say, well, I don't want to talk to y'all. I want y'all to come in until Wednesday. And then he says, I don't want to see you for a month. Do I lose face? Do I lose? No, I keep doing what he told me to do. But then when he says it's time to move, then I'm ready to move. Are we at that place that we are mature enough to understand activity is never more than his flow? We can't be so caught up in what the rituals and the things we've put together that make us comfortable in his presence than, making, than wanting his presence. Which means he has the right. It's his church. It's his people. He has a, remember, we are leaving a place on our way to promise. And we haven't gotten there yet. And he, and so until he, we get to the fullness of what he wants the church to do, the church has to be at a place to recognize his presence is greater than our activity. He told Israel, I don't even like yourself. I don't even like the rituals y'all doing. I don't even like what you, he says, because you've gotten so place that you know how to do them with your eyes closed. He said, they're coming out of your lips, your mouth. He said, you don't mean them from your heart. And has your relationship with the father gotten so until it's a, a thing you can do with your eyes closed? You, you can set the time table as to when you could stay at home, eat breakfast, do, do all the ironing, and get to church in time for the shout. If we've gotten like that, then we, he's not respecting our worship. Our worship is not done with willingness or obedience or, or even a response. Here we are. So, so I just want to set the stage. You're going to hear me keep saying it. And when we meet on the 31st, I'm pretty much going to go over some of the same stuff and go a little bit further. But, but don't come planning to sit. Come planning to shift, move, different place. Because God is calling us to another place in him. He's calling us to walk with our spiritual gifts. He's calling us to help other people. He's calling us to step out of our comfort zone even in this pandemic. Amen? Amen? We okay? I appreciate y'all hanging in there. Um, any insight? Any word? Are y'all digesting it? Is it fresh? Is it different? Yes. Tim giving me that. Tim's giving me that deacon head wave. It's all right, Reverend. It's all right, Reverend. 
<laughs> Thank you, Pastor. I truly feel that this is what the pandemic was truly all about, to get us back in the proper alignment with his enrichment.